Prostate Cancer Staging 101. Here's everything that you want to know about the staging of prostate cancer. Here I'm showing you two figures. On the left side is a view of the prostate from the posterior aspect. And on the right side, this is a sagittal view. This is a cross section of the anatomy of the male pelvis. The prostate is this organ right here. The prostate is split, split into the left and the right lobe. The prostate also has something called a capsule. The capsule is like a peel or rind around a clementine. Below the prostate, something called the penile bulb and the crew. These are organs of sexual function. And just on top of the prostate is the bladder. It's this organ here. And the bladder is like a water balloon with the walls that are muscle. So it's always trying to contract and it's trying to push urine out through the urethra and through the prostate and out of the body. Right behind the bladder and just on top of the prostate are the seminal vesicles or the SVs. The SVs are sometimes divided into the proximal and the distal portions. The ureters are two tubes that come from the kidneys and drain into the bladder. So here they are. There are also some important blood vessels in the pelvis. These include the obturators. So here I'm just showing you the arteries in red, but there are also veins associated with these. So there are obturator arteries, external iliac arteries, internal iliac arteries, and the internals and the externals feed into the common iliacs. And these are also locations where lymph nodes be present. And the other area where lymph nodes may be located are the presacral space. The sacrum is the tailbone. So that's, that's this organ right here. The lymph nodes are also sometimes split into these areas. So I've demarcated them with this gray dotted line. And the, the boundary is basically right above where the iliacs go into the, the, or the common iliacs split into the internal and the external iliacs. For men who are diagnosed with a clinical T1C cancer, this means that this cancer was detected by PSA screening alone, and it is not palpable, meaning that when you do a digital rectal exam, you cannot feel the cancer. This is the most common cancer that is detected in the USA because of PSA screening. PSA is that blood test that some men have when they, they reach their 60s. A T2A cancer means that you can feel something on the digital rectal exam, so it is palpable. However, it is less than one half of one lobe, either the left side or the right side. And I put them in, in green because these are usually favorable, meaning that they're usually lower risk cancers. I'll tell you more about that in a second. A T2B cancer is palpable, but it is more than one half and up to one whole lobe of the prostate. A T2C cancer is palpable and it involves both sides. So when you do the digital rectal, you feel it on both sides. A T3A cancer is one that has extra capsular extent. Um, so this means that, that it's the cancer is going through the peel or the rind of the clementine. Now, notably, this is actually really difficult to feel on a rectal exam, and the rectal exams are really subjective. It's not a great part of the staging system. And I, I will tell you uh, that, that most physicians cannot reliably detect T3 disease. Men can sometimes have other imaging done, like an MRI or a PET scan that can help with staging. However, the MRI should not be used to assign the clinical T3 stage because it actually uh, it upstages men, what we call upstages. So that means that, that 
they are assigned a higher stage than they normally would be and their treatment recommendations are totally altered because of this. Um, the treatment recommendations become much more intense and the treatment becomes much more intense and, and uh, more toxic. Um, so when physicians write their notes, they write it's you know maybe clinical T1 disease or clinical T2 disease, but radiographically, meaning that when we did an MRI, maybe there was T3A disease, that it was coming outside of the prostate. T3B disease means that there is seminal vesicle invasion. So this is also very difficult to detect on a rectal exam. T3B disease, however, is relatively commonly detected on MRIs. So when we do MRIs, we often see that the cancer, if it's growing, especially in the top part of the prostate, is starting to invade into the seminal vesicles. Most prostate cancers form in the peripheral zone. The peripheral zone is basically like the, the very back part of the prostate, right over here. Um, so that means that it's actually relatively far away from the urethra. And most, most prostate cancers uh, are so far away from the, the urethra that they would not cause any kind of obstruction or any kind of urinary symptoms. And so most men are diagnosed asymptomatically. They have no symptoms related to the prostate cancer. T4 disease means that the prostate cancer is involving the external sphincter, the bladder, the rectum, the levator muscles, or the pelvic sidewall. And then there's also something called nodal staging or end staging. So everything that we looked at so far was the T stage. You're gonna see the T stage that is the primary tumor. The next thing you're gonna see is the nodal staging. So N1 means that there are regional lymph nodes involved. And uh, specifically N1 means that the internal iliacs, the external iliacs, obturators, or presacral lymph nodes are involved. There are also non-regional lymph nodes. And so if the common iliacs are involved, this is technically non-regional disease. And with the use of PSMA PET scans, which have been used since about 2019 in the US, we are seeing nodal involvement much more commonly. And this is affecting treatment recommendations. Now, interestingly, PSMA PET scans can be used in assigning the stage, the, the end stage, but the T stage technically should still be assigned based on the just the digital rectal exam alone. I it whenever I stage patients, I write in the staging how this stage was determined because if you're trying to compare patients' potential outcomes and their treatment recommendations from 10, 15 years ago versus the common era today, it will be a drastic difference because we just didn't have the same technology 15 plus years ago, like with, with MRIs or PSMA PET scans that we do today. And so it's much easier to quote unquote upstage patients and wind up recommending a much more aggressive treatment than they would have had 15 years ago. The other stage that you'll see is the M stage. M is metastatic. So is there distant metastatic disease? And here I'm showing you one example of a distant metastasis in the bone, in this, the sacrum specifically, or the, the tailbone. You can also have distant metastases in other bones of the body. You can have non-regional lymph nodes that would count as M1 disease. And so if you have lymph nodes that are in the abdomen or somewhere else throughout the body, these would also count as M1 disease. So everything that we looked at so far is part of the AJCC staging system. The, uh, this is a common system that is used throughout the body for various organ systems, and it's the TNM staging system. And this is the uh, staging system the, that gives you stage one, stage two, three, four. And interestingly, for prostate cancer, even though we obtain this stage, it is not used for treatment recommendations. So you, you have this stage, but it's actually not really part of what uh, how, how your treatment will, uh, will be decided. And there are also some issues with the AJCC staging system. So one of the issues that you might notice is that the involvement of lymph nodes is stage four disease. And you might think, oh, this, this is uh, you know, very bad. This is a, a poor prognosis. Um, and that's actually not true. Men who have lymph nodes that are involved often have 
survival times that are measured in many years and many decades, and they're still very likely to die of something else besides prostate cancer. And the same thing actually holds true for men with metastatic disease in bones or, or other sites. Those men are very often likely to die of something besides prostate cancer. So if we're not using the AJCC staging system for treatment recommendations, what do we use? Well, we use something called the NCCN risk groups. So the NCCN is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And here I'm showing you a table that is juxtaposing the different risk groups. And the, these risk groups take into account your clinical T-stage, the biopsy Gleason score. So the Gleason score is how aggressive the prostate cancer looks underneath the microscope. It also takes into account your PSA, which is measured in nanograms per milliliter. It also takes into account the percent of positive cores. So from the biopsy, how many cores were involved divided by the number of cores uh, that were taken. And then it can also take into account some other risk features the end stage and the M stage. So let's go through this table. For very low and low risk prostate cancer, you have to meet all these criteria. So this means that you either have a cancer that is not detectable by a rectal exam, or it is uh, just a, a, a small mass that is palpable and less than half of a lobe. The Gleason score or the Gleason grade group has to be a one. So Gleason grade group one means that this is Gleason three plus three equals six prostate cancer. Um, so this means uh, the, the Gleason grade group goes, uh, the old system went on a scale of six to 10. People found that confusing. So it's been converted. So now one through five with the Gleason grade groups. So now one is not aggressive, five is the most aggressive. And so one is the same thing as a six in the old system. Your PSA for low and very low risk has to be less than 10. And for very low risk specifically, you have to have less than three cores involved and less than 50% of cores being positive. Very low risk also takes into account your PSA density. So it's less than this value of 0.15 nanograms per milliliter per gram prostate. Uh, the, the prostate gram is, uh, so that this is determined by the prostate size. An average prostate size is about 30 to 60 cubic centimeters, or it's the same thing for grams. Uh, each gram is about one cc, and so that's how this value is determined. Prostate size is not necessarily a bad thing. Like if you have a large prostate, it's like some men are tall, some men are short, some men have large prostates, some have small. And so uh, just because a prostate is large does not mean that, that you're more prone to getting cancer or that you are uh, you have a bad cancer when you're diagnosed or anything like that. And so sometimes when scans are done, like when men have MRIs done or a CT scan, the report will say there is quote unquote prostatomegaly. That just means that the prostate's larger than normal. I always look at the prostate size, uh, you know, what, what's actually being quoted? What are they calling prostatomegaly? Because sometimes uh, the interpreting radiologist will say that, uh, but the, the prostate size is actually right in that normal range. Okay, what else do you need for very low and low risk? So no lymph node involvement, no metastasis. And so that just means that your AJCC stage is going to be stage one. The next NCCN risk group is intermediate risk disease. Um, so when we say risk, what is the risk referred to, by the way? The risk in part refers to the risk of metastases, the risk of cancer cells being present in other parts of the body. Even though you might not be able to see them on a scan, you might have cancer cells that are flowing through the blood vessels or through the lymphatic vessels. And so if you're at very high risk, it means that you're, you have high risk of having this. If you're at intermediate risk, we think that there's some chance that there are cancer cells that are starting to float in, in the body somewhere and they might not be latching onto anything. It's kind of like a, you know, a dandelion when you blow on the seeds and the cancer cells maybe have started to spread to other areas, but they haven't landed anywhere. Okay, so intermediate risk disease. This is a 
controversial area and we need better staging in this area because uh, for, for favorable intermediate risk disease, what this means is that you can only have one intermediate risk factor, which the intermediate risk factors are listed here, and you cannot have grade group three disease. So you can have grade group two disease, and then uh, you can have, and, and, and you know that, that could be it, or you could have a PSA that is between 10 and 20. Um, but you can't have T2B or T2C disease. Once you start getting multiple unfavorable intermediate risk factors, you start to go into the unfavorable intermediate risk cohort. So um, most commonly, we see men with something like grade group two disease or their PSA is just barely above a 10. The other thing that can push you into the unfavorable intermediate risk subgroup is if you have more than 50% of the cores involved. So when, when prostate biopsies are done, the urologist will take needles and put them into the prostate. And usually something like 12 cores or 12 needles are taken. And they, those are sent to a different doctor called a pathologist. And the pathologist will tell you what's the Gleason score within each one and how many of those cores have any kind of prostate cancer in them. So, Look at the number of cores that are involved divided by the total of total number of cores, and then this is how you get your percent positive cores. Importantly, you should not take into account cores that are taken from the region of interest. What that means is that if you have an MRI done and the MRI says, oh, we there's a lesion that's right here in the prostate, something looks suspicious in this part of the prostate. Well, the urologist who's going to do the biopsy is going to take extra needles and put them into this area. So it's going to be, if you start to account for these needles, and you might see this labeled as a region of interest, ROI, on the report, if you assume that those needles are probably going to be positive, those cores will probably show prostate cancer. So if you start to include them in your calculation, then you will uh, start to, to increase the percent positive cores. So for that reason, we do not include them in this percent positive cores number. Intermediate risk, the other things about it, of course, you cannot have any nodes involved, you cannot have distant metastases, and usually this is stage two disease from the AJCC eighth edition. Okay, high risk prostate cancer, what gets you into high risk? So the most common things that'll buy you high risk disease are grade group four disease, or grade group five is, is very high risk, or a PSA that is more than 20. Um, you can see the, the clinical T stage listed here. So if you have T3A or T3B and T3-4 disease, or, or T, excuse me, T4 disease, yes, th this also is, is high risk. However, remember that you cannot assess this technically based on the MRI. Uh, the, uh, MRIs, if you start to use MRIs to assign T stage, a lot of men will, certain, will, will suddenly start to fall into the high risk group. And uh, that... That's not a good thing because you, then the treatments that are gonna be recommended are much higher intensity uh, for them. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that in subsequent presentations. High risk is usually, if you're, if you're high risk just because of grade group four disease, it's stage 2C. And if you're a high risk because of other reasons, it's stage 3A to 3C. And again, we don't really look at the, these stages. They, they exist, but most clinicians don't really take them into account. Okay, what is the regional risk group? Regional risk group means that you have lymph nodes involved, usually noted on a PSMA PET scan. Sometimes you can also see it on an MRI. And this is N1 disease. It doesn't really matter what else you have in terms of the clinical, the T stage or the, your PSA or your, your Gleason score. If you have nodes that are seen, it kind of overrides everything else. And this becomes stage 4A. Importantly, you cannot have distant metastases. You have to be M0. So once you start, once you break this boundary into M1, this is metastatic. This is the metastatic risk group and it is either stage 4B or 4C.